Like Harry said, my name is Justin Hughes. I do work for the Corps of Engineers in the regulatory program and here in Kansas City. Um, I'm going to talk to you tonight, or I'm going to give you kind of a regulatory overview. Um, it's probably going to be more like a crash course in regulatory. We're going to cover a lot of ground, um, but it's really the only way you can really know, you know all the different aspects of our program. So I'll give you a warning. I could probably spend about half a day on any one of these slides, but um, you know, we've got some limited time here, so it's going to come, come fast. And these, these are basically the outline that we have here and the different topics I'm going to cover. I'm going to talk about regulatory authorities. I'm also going to talk, touch on jurisdiction, talk about permitting mechanisms and processes, and then we're going to end on mitigation. And I'm hoping to show you some um, nice pictures, some mitigated areas. And then we'll end with some questions and answers. So our regulatory authorities, we, we have two, um, one being Section 10 of the Rivers and Harbors Act. And basically what this is, or this authorizes um, work or either structures in Section 10 or navigable waters, like the Missouri River. So examples would be, um, and it, it is actually for any work, it would be in, um, over, or any under the navigable water. So some examples would be like dredging, um, but you would also have uh, like a, if you wanted to install a pier or if they uh, wanted to put an aerial transmission line across the Missouri River, that would require a Section 10 permit or horizontally directory drilling and put in a pipeline under the Missouri River, that would also require Section 10 authorization. The other um, authority we have is Section 404 of the Clean Water Act, and that authorizes the discharge of fill or dredge material into waters of the United States. And those being um, wetlands, streams, uh, rivers, impoundments, things like that. Um, and some examples of that would be if somebody wanted to put in a culvert crossing in a stream for a roadway, that would require Section 404. And also, if, say, a developer wanted to fill wetlands to, to put in like a residential development, that would also be a, an activity that would require 404 authorization. I like to show this slide because it shows the overlap between Section 10 and Section 404. And it, the example I'd like to give is, is if you had like a, a pier, somebody wanted to install a pier like on the Missouri River. Well, that's a, that's a, a structure that's going to possibly um, affect the navigability of that river. So it would require Section 10 authorization. If you wanted to protect that pier with say like a riprap revetment, that would also require Section 10 authorization but it would also require Section 404 authorization because that riprap would constitute fill and it, it would be so it would be a discharge of fill material into a water of the U.S. So what are waters of the U.S.? Well, it's your traditional navigable waters. You also have your stream, impoundments of streams, interstate waters, the so waters that cross state lines, and then you also have uh, wetlands that are adjacent to, to some of these waters and your territorial seas. So, in my job, I get a lot of calls, and, and they, a lot of times, it, you know, a gentleman calling, and he wants to do some work behind his house or do some work on his property, and he'll say something to the effect that, I would like to fill the ditch, you know, behind my house, or I would like to uh, build a pond on the creek, or creek, depending on where, you, where, you, where you're from, you know, that's, near my house or on my property, or I would like to um, pipe a gully or something like that because it's gotten too wide and we can't go across it anymore. And the point I'm trying to make is that for streams, you know, people have different um, terms that they use to, to, to say what a stream is or what they think a stream or what different ideas of what a stream is, I, I would say. For the core, a stream has to have two things. It has to have an ordinary high water mark and it has to have a bed and bank. And everybody pretty much understands what a bed and bank is on a stream. The ordinary high water mark is a little harder to discern and a little harder to explain, but the way I always try to explain it to, to a, an applicant is, is it's, it's basically a line, a natural line impressed on the bank where you have the destruction of terrestrial vegetation, shelving, sediment deposits, um, rack lines, things like that, they kind of mark it. It's, it's uh, the ordinary high water mark. So it's a high water mark, 
when you're having high flow or normal high flows, but it's not like a, you know, when you're, you're having like a flood event. So it's somewhere in between the top of the bank and somewhere between the, the, the water level if you're going out there and evaluating the stream on a normal day when it's not raining or something like that. Um, and examples, you know, we got here, you know, so it'd be somewhere here in this area or, you know, somewhere below those willows on that. Um, but again, you know, um, it's very important for us because it's actually the shoreward limit of our jurisdiction for a stream. So anything below the ordinary high water mark, we, we would, or any discharges below the ordinary high water mark, we would regulate. Anything above it, we don't regulate. So three types of streams. We have perennial streams that flow year round. We have intermittent streams that flow seasonally. And in both of those, you usually have some kind of groundwater component that's helped feed the stream, you know, during these, or, or during a lower flow air time. Um, ephemeral streams are streams that flow when it rains and for short periods of time after it rains. Again, if, if, if it has a bed and bank and ordinary high water mark, we're probably going to regulate even, even an ephemeral stream. I, I like to take this time to just kind of, if you, if you have an ephemeral stream, or if I, let's say I'm out on a site and I'm looking at an ephemeral stream, if I decide to walk upstream and kind of higher up in the watershed, at some point, I'm probably going to find it where I no longer have an ordinary high water mark and I no longer have a, bed and a true bed and bank. And at that point, I no longer have a jurisdiction and we would refer to that as a drainage feature. So wetlands, if you're familiar at all with the, with the core pro regulatory program, you've heard about the 87 manual. Um, we also have regional supplements that we use that are specific to certain geographic area. Um, and we use these to basically identify and delineate wetlands. And it's a three parameter approach. We're looking for at this area and, and, and trying to determine if the majority of the, the plants there are hydrophytic or, or water loving, or a better term would probably be water tolerant. Um, we're looking for hydrology. And in this case, you know, it's when you have standing water, it makes it really, really easy. It's never that easy in the field, I can tell you. But there are other hydrologic indicators um, like water stained leaves, um, water marks on trees, uh, uh, crack soils, algal matting, things like that, that that will tell us that water's been standing on that area for a prolonged period of time. And then we look at the, the soils. We'll actually take a, a soil sample and evaluate that. And when you have saturated soils, the, the um, chemistry in the soil changes. It, it becomes anaerobic, and it actually develops um, features in the soil that we can look at or we can discern and find that will tell us if it's hydric or not. And this, I know it's really hard to see, but if, if you look really closely, you can kind of see these little reddish orange areas in there. And those are um, concentrations of what we call redox concentrations. And it's from the, where the iron is basically reduced in the soil. And again, if you have all three of those things, then, then we would say that you have a wetland. So up to this point, we talked about jurisdictional um, areas. We're now going to talk about um, some non-jurisdictional areas. And, you know, despite what you might have heard, we, we don't regulate swimming pools. Um, we don't regulate the water that comes out of your gutter. Um, and, and if you kind of look through these, you'll see one thing that says in dry land pretty much every time. So we, if you are creating one of these features and it's out of dry land, so a, a good example would be like a, if you're looking out on a field and you'll see this um, stock pond but basically somebody dug out the side of the hill. So it's taking the local runoff that's coming off that hill and just storing it in that pond. That's not a, a, a jurisdictional feature for us. Um, it, it would fall under that um, artificial lakes or ponds created in dry land for farm or stock watering. Um, so again, th these are what we kind of refer to as preamble waters. Um, same idea here, if you had a, a, a kind of a depressional area that that was created due to incidental to a construction activity, um, we wouldn't regulate that unless, you know, let's say somebody had a borrow area and it was right next to a stream and they, and they create a little basin area there and 20 years down the road, the property's been sold, we have a change in use, we have a new um, developer coming in and he wants to develop that property and we go to that area and it's got hydric soils, it's got wetland hydrology, and it's got hydrophytic vegetation. We're very likely to say that's now a wetland and, 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 and regulate that. Wastewater treatment systems, so wastewater treatment lagoons can kind of look like wetlands sometimes, but we don't regulate that. They're regulated by another part of the Clean Water Act, um, so they're not waters of the U.S. 
so your section 404. So up to this point, we've been talking about um, geographic features that are on the landscape that are either regulated or not regulated. We're now going to talk about activities. Um, so these are activities that may be a discharge of field material into a water of the U.S., but they've been determined to be exempt. So they're, they're exempt under the regulation. And that includes normal farming, uh, maintenance of drainage ditches, um, the uh, construction or maintenance of like a, a road for um, forestry management um, or, or timber harvesting, something like that. Uh, you notice there is a recapture provision there. And the, the idea behind that is, is to say you had a, uh, a farmer and he wanted, he, or we just say we had somebody and they came in and they wanted to put in an, an irrigation pond. And that pond was so big that, and when we looked at it, and so large that we thought that that pond would affect the flow and circulation of the entire stream reach, that it would really impair that. Well, that might be a circumstance where we would look at that recapture provision and say, you know, we may like we want to recapture this and, and actually regulate it. So again, for regulated activities, um, we have two types of perm or two um, groups of permits here. And one being our general permits. And these are for minor activities. So we've looked at these and determined they're minor. You know, overall, the watershed is going to be minimal. And the biggest group there is what we call our nationwides. And there's quite a, a good many of those out there. And the way I like to, to explain a nationwide is, is that it's basically a permit that's already out there. And when somebody at, requests one, we're actually verifying um, that they qualify for a nationwide. Uh, to qualify, they, actually, they have to meet um, the uh, limits in the description of the nationwide, but they, and they also have to meet any regional and condi general conditions of the nationwide. And if they do so, then that nationwide's out there for them to use. We have these regional general permits with the same kind of idea. They do, they have um, uh, general regional conditions as well, specific limits. And, um, but the idea behind those is that the, um, therefore, specific activities that are common activities in a certain geographic area. So somebody does, or we, we see a lot of a certain activity that's minor, so we developed a general permit in there to kind of address that so we don't have to go through the individual permit process every time. Program ag general permits um, are basically permits where another entity is permitting something on our behalf, again, for a minor activity. Um, if it doesn't meet those requirements, then we have to basically process it under our individual permit process or a standard permit. And there's two types of those, and we don't use any letters of permission in, in this area, so I'm not gonna go over that, um, but we'll, we will talk about individual permits. I, I would add, so the nationwide, we typically try to, to process those in like 60 days. Um, the, the individual permits are much more in-depth review, and, and we, we typically take 120, or we try to, a metric to try to reach um, is, is to have those processed in 120 days. So just kind of a regulatory review real quick. You know, first thing we do is we determine geographic jurisdiction. And we, we talked about that some, you know, is, is it a water of the US? And this is for our 404 program. And if it is, then we look and say, was, is that activity, um, is it actually a discharge of fill material? And if you can imagine, we get some calls sometimes, and, and one very common call is, is that we'll get is that somebody will be tattling on a neighbor and they'll say, well, he's out there and he's clearing the repairing corridor of the stream. He's, he's taking all the trees away. And the first thing we'll ask and say, well, is he actually discharged any fill material into the stream? And if you remember from what we talked about before, my, my authority basically ends at the ordinary high water mark. So we want to know, you know, is he actually doing any work basically in the stream bed? And if he's not, then, then we don't have any, any regulatory authority there. Um, so it's real care you know, that's part and part of it, you know, it might be in a jurisdictional area, but we actually have to have that discharge of fill material, you know, to, to be able to regulate it. If we say um, it is a, uh, a, um, a discharge, then the next thing we're going to look and see if it falls in any of those exemptions we talked about. Um, if it does not, then we'll look and see if it um, meets one of the general conditions, or the, you know, meets the regional general conditions of the of a nationwide, it qualifies for a nationwide, and if no, then, then we go into our individual permit process. And this is basically the permit review process. It starts with an app receipt of an application, and after we get the application, we um, will put it, and if it's complete, we'll put it on public notice for 21 days. 
Um, resource agencies can request a, a full 30 days, and, and they regularly do. And it'll go to different people. And basically, we have an email list that um, anybody who's shown an interest that they want to get um, a, a copy of a public notice um, is on that list, so we'll send it to them. We also send it to all the resource agencies, and we, we'll actually mail a copy to all the adjacent property owners. And this is basically all the groups that will comment on a public notice. And you can see the core, so the core might comment because maybe it impacts uh, or comes close to a core project. So they may have some, we may have some interest, so we may get some internal comments. You have individuals, and this could be for or against, um, you know, adjacent property owners. And sometimes people just have a special interest in what's going on in their community and, and they'll decide to comment as well. Special interests, so environmental groups. Um, so sometimes we do have like pro-development type groups that will comment. Uh, state and local agencies, this could be your Missouri Department of Natural Resources, MDC, um, tribes, and then resource agencies, EPA, Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, all those folks, you know, provide comments. And what we'll do is, is look at those comments and read through them and try to figure out which ones are substantive and pertinent to our program. As you can imagine, sometimes we get comments um, that really don't have anything to do with our program. And in those cases, we don't forward those on to, to the applicant, but the other ones we do, and we have an evaluation process there too, so what we're gonna do is evaluate the project, and, and, and I'll go into this a little bit more detail, but we're likely to come up with a list of concerns as well. And, and it's gonna come in a letter, and we're gonna send that to the applicant with those comments. When the, um, the uh, letter goes out to the applicant, they typically will respond back because um, they want a permit, obviously, and we, we require them to, to provide a response in order to do that. And we use their response, the comments that we got, and our evaluation process to determine you know, whether we're not going to whether we're going to permit it, permit it or not. This again, this process um, we strive for 120 days. Um, but as you can imagine, there's a lot of coordination going on here. Um, another thing is that we're, and I'll go into this a little more depth later, they're typically having to modify their project. And to change those plans and, and do that, you know, could take some time. So a lot of times you get these uh, projects that have a lot of comments and highlight issues, more controversial, complex projects, more environmental impact, the longer it takes to get them through that process. So other laws and regulations. Um, the thing I like to note here is, is the core, it, you know, because we're issuing this permit, that's a federal action. So because we're taking on a federal action, we're required to comply with the Endangered Species Act. We're required to comply with the National Historic Preservation Act, NEPA, and also we're required to, to obtain 401 water quality certification from the appropriate state, whether it be Missouri or, or Kansas, before we're able to issue the permit. Um, this is gonna be kind of a rub when we're trying to get the information we need to um, satisfy comments from Fish and Wildlife Service or National Historic Preservation Office um, from the applicant, because we have to get the information from them so we can provide it to, to, to the different resource agencies. A um, good example is, is like an endangered species survey. If we need to get that, we have to get the applicant to go hire somebody to do it, provide it to us, and then we can forward it on to, to the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, and that can take some time. Again, it's just kind of one of those factors that factor in, you know, how long it takes to permit something. So public interest, um, we have 22 public interest factors, and this is just kind of an evaluation process or, or test, if you will, part of our process. And I won't read through these, um, but what I will say is, is it's, a, it's a kind of a weighted balance type test. And what I mean by that, it's not a, a popularity contest. It's not like if you get 10 pros and, and five cons, it's automatically you're going to get um, a permit or, or a favorable permit decision. You could have one um, factor, and that factor may weigh so heavily that it, it outweighs all the beneficial type. What I mean, or a good example of that may be is if you had like a municipality or something like that, and say they're on the Missouri River, and they wanted to build a recreation type uh, tourist attraction facility um, right there on the river, and um, so that's going to have some pros to it, you know, on some of these uh, are benefits, you know, as far as looking at some of these public interest factors. Um, you know, it's going to boost the local economy. Somebody's got to go out there and build it. It's going to bring people into the area. It's going to provide a recreational opportunities. So it'll have some good benefits there. But let's say that 
projects right on the bend of the Missouri River, and it's on the outer bend, and it just so happens the channel comes really close to the bank right there, and it's extending out. Well, the fact that they, they may impede navigation, that one factor might may kind of weigh to where we're make, looking at a decision to say, you know, you need to change this, you need to pull it back, relocate it somewhere else, or, you know, we might have to deny it because, um, you know, obviously navigation, very, the Corps is going to protect the navigation of the river, and um, that's just one of those factors that, like I said, could, could really steer the decision. 404B1 guidelines, again, um, just part of our evaluation. And the way I would like to explain this is, is so if you have an applicant and he's got impacts to, to streams and wetlands, and let's say his, his project's not water dependent, which most developments are, so he's, got, he's doing a, a residential development, he's got impacts to streams and wetlands, and those are what we consider special aquatic sites. So the core automatically presumes that he has other alternatives that would have less impact to the aquatic environment. And it's up to the applicant to actually show us otherwise. And they do that by going through this, this sequencing. Um, and this is part of this, the process of when I was talking about that letter that we'll send to them after the public notice. It'll include things like us, you know, us asking them, say, well, you have a lot of aquatic resources on this property. What other sites did you look at in your geographic area that might have less impact or have less streams and have less wetlands than your, your subject site? Um, and if they can show that that site that they have is, is basically their only alternative, we'll look at the on site and we'll say, well, why can't you change the configuration of this? Why can't you move this here and, or, or take this off your project plans to avoid that nice wetland there or the larger wetland? or to avoid that entire stream segment. And the whole process, it has to be practicable to the applicant. Um, so we can't demand things and, and, and it has to be um, capable of being done and taking into account logistics, costs, and technology. But it is up to them to be able to demonstrate that it is the least environmentally damaging practical alternative, that what they're proposing is basically their, their only alternative to be able to, to um, complete their project, suit their project purpose. So if we're able to get through that, again, avoidance minimization, we get to compensatory mitigation. And basically what, you know, what that is, is they've got wetland and stream impacts, and we're now requiring them to, um, again, for their unavoidable impacts, they have to replace that with wetland and streams somewhere else. And so we're gonna talk about mitigation, basically for here on out. And the idea is, is the mitigation is we're getting to a known overall net loss of wetland and stream. So in 2008, the Corps did or, or a really great thing happened. A uh, mitigation rule got um, put out. And um, it, one of the great things about it is it provides this preference hierarchy for, for mitigation alternatives. And just so everybody's on the same page, basically a mitigation bank is, and I, and I should say, a mitigation bank is being number one, so that's the most preferred alternative, followed by in Luffy, followed by different variations of primary responsible. So a mitigation bank is basically where you have a private entity and they're, they're purchasing land and, and improving the aquatic resources on that property to generate mitigation credit that they can then sell to the permittee to offset his, his impact. Um, I would say a mitigation bank goes through a very strenuous review. Um, there's a lot of thought put into how much credit will be generated at the bank and, and awarded for the bank. And they also, when they're going through their, um, after they establish the bank, they have to meet certain milestones before we will release any credit. Uh, that's important, you know, when can you compare them to like an in-lieu fee. So in the in-lieu fee, you basically have a, a nonprofit or a government organization and they're um, basically allowed to sell a certain amount of advanced credits. And once they get enough funds, then they go out and build a project. Um, the idea or the reason why you have this preference is the mitigation bank, when the, per the permittee is coming in to purchase the mitigation credit, the mitigation is basically already on the ground. It's not only on the ground, we've, we've likely evaluated it and said, you know, yeah, you're doing a good job, everything's coming along the way it's supposed to, and they're... Um, then getting the, the release credit so they can sell it. That's get different with the NLU fee, where the NLU fee may not have a project even in mind yet, you know, when they're, when they're selling that credit. Um, so 
there's some time lag and risk associated with there, and that's basically why we, we have a preference for the mitigation bank. Um, the third option there is permitting responsible, and I'll talk a little bit more about permitting responsible, but it's lower because there is more risk involved. And what we've shown over history, and that was kind of the reasoning behind putting out the mitigation rule, it hasn't worked very well. So permitting responsible issues. Um, so there used to not be a lot of mitigation or much uh, interest in mitigation banking. So there weren't a lot of alternatives for, for the developer to, to use to, to, you know, to offset his impacts. So what we ended up doing is, is uh, you'd have these permitting responsible sites. A lot of times they were in the development itself. You know, it was the land that they avoided during the permitting process or land they couldn't build on for one reason or another. And it ends up being kind of surrounded by development. So you end up with a kind of like a postage stamp type mitigation area. And we don't like, or you know, they're not as beneficial. The idea behind the mitigation bank is you're pulling resources. So you end up with a bigger mitigation area that's gonna provide more ecological benefit. It's gonna provide corridors and, and things like that better for wildlife, um, as opposed to you know, having a little mitigation area here and a little mitigation area here. Um, another uh, issue we have is with encroachment. So you have uh, the mitigation area in, in in a lot of these areas, the, the developer, you know, once he's built the development, he's, he's, he moves on. So it's, it's left to be managed by the HOA, and it's basically managed as common ground. And we all know, so if, if somebody has a, uh, some land and it backs up to common ground, where nobody's really there to, to keep them off of, you know, they, people tend to kind of like extend their backyards a little bit. So, so we've seen a lot of that, and we've actually, I've gotten a phone call from, from an individual who, who asked if they could cut down all the trees Know, behind their behind the house and they saw the signs out there so they knew enough to at least to call us and ask and um, we, I had to explain to them so when actually the developer planted those trees um, to offset impacts to the stream to basically build the development somewhere else and um, we don't want you to cut them down please don't and, and, and try to explain to her you know the benefit you know of having those trees there you know as far as having the raw parent corridor and the benefits to the stream um, so that's that's an issue as well This is kind of an example where I was talking about postage stamps. So you end up with these you know, smaller mitigation areas that are kind of surrounded by development. So mitigation, some important ideas here is, is real estate protection. So currently or now, we're basically requiring a um, perpetual conservation easement that's gonna be held by a third party easement holder. Um, there are some other uh, mechanisms out there, you know, possibly for like a, a conservation agency or something like that, where, you know, they may not have to do that. But for most part, we're, we're requiring conservation easements to make sure that that mitigation is protected in perpetuity. We're using a watershed approach. Um, so if, if somebody wants to impact or somebody wants to mitigate outside of the watershed, we, we, we really only do that if there's no other alternatives available. And we're looking at higher ratios to, to you know, kind of, again, encourage them to, to, uh, to mitigate as close to the impacts as possible. Um, we're also trying, you know, within the watershed, do a better job of siting sites, you know, where you're going to have the most benefit, you know, where, where the um, receiving stream or river is going to, to um, again, receive the most help. Uh, functional assessment methods. So in Missouri and in Kansas, we've been using functional assessment methods for some time now to determine the amount of credit that a uh, uh, permittee would have to purchase, you know, per, per se from a mitigation bank. Um, we also use that to determine how much credit will be given to a mitigation bank, you know, you know how much the bank, the, the activities they're doing on that bank will actually generate as well. They're working on a functional assessment method for, um, for, for wetlands in Missouri, but that, that hasn't come out yet. Timing, so we talked about timing and how that kind of dictates the hierarchy on the, um, the uh, mitigation preference, you know, those alternatives. But another thing about timing, so let's say somebody wanted to impact a one acre wetland. Well, we expect them to replace in kind, which means they would have to replace that wetland with a, hopefully with another forested wetland. Um, but we recognize that the, uh, the mature forested wetland that has trees that have been growing there for 20, 30 years has, has a lot more function and value. And it's gonna take a really long time for that developing wetland to, to get to a point where it's got the same function and value as, that, as the one that they're impacting. So 
we kind of take that into consideration and we may require mitigation at a higher ratio to kind of take care of that temporal loss, if you will. Ecologically preferred, um, this is important because we, we, if you remember back on that um, hierarchy preference um, slide, we had permitted responsible mitigation um, watershed as the third option there. So let's say um, a, a developer they, 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 or some entity wants to, to um, they don't want to purchase mitigation from the mitigation bank. They say, well, it costs too much money. You know, the mitigation bank is, is too expensive. We can't afford it. Um, that's not a suitable alternative to defeat that hierarchy. We're not gonna let them do that. Um, same thing if they say, well, we, we wanna do it, um, let's say the mitigation bank's in another county or, or closer to another municipality. And they say, well, we would rather keep that mitigation closer to home. Um, that's really not uh, uh, a suitable um, argument either. Um, but you can use this ecologically preferred. So let's say the, the, the um, permittee has a property and it's next to a mitigation bank or it's next to a conservation area. And it happens to be on the same river system as where their impacts are. And we got the same confidence in that mitigation as we would a mitigation bank and, and um, with as far as the uh, financial assurances and the, and the um, protection you know, in perpetuity. Um, that might be a situation where we say, well, that, that, that could be ecologically preferred and, and that might be an alternative we would go. But that, that's, again, case by case and, and for most cases, most now, for the most part now, we're not doing any permitting responsible. It's all going to a mitigation bank. If there's not, there's not a mitigation bank available, it will then go to an MO fee. If there's not an MO fee, then we might look at permitting responsible. So how do they do this? You know, kind of idea, um, you know, what is a mitigation bank and, and what do they look for and then how do they develop it? If you can see here, you know, so this is just, uh, you know, um, some farm ground here. It's in Kansas. And you can see there where there, there, there's these streams that have been straightened. Um, and it also ditched. So the property's been ditched pretty extensively. I'd like to show you kind of this area here. It's a pretty good hydrologic signature. Well, if you compare that to, to this photo, aerial photo, which is, is taken substantially later, you see you know, kind of why the, the banker you know, chose that site. Um, you notice that he's built most of his wetland pools, and this is where you saw that, that hydrology. Um, he's filled in the ditches, and he's, he's actually provided some um, restored stream channel where he's provided some sinuosity you know, to, to basically, um, you know, where you have these straightened channels, he's now put some curves in there and again, added some sinuosity there. You know, and, and that uh, has worked very well. You can see how wet that site is now. So this, um, again, just stream mitigation activities. Um, this is photo here is actually just above that mitigation site I just showed you. And you can see where he's cut a new channel here. He hasn't, at, at the time of this photo, he hadn't planted that, but he will plant trees on you know, both sides. The old channel is this, it's that one, you know, it's basically one line of trees that were left and, um, and you can see they're not very, very big or anything. So at some point, you know, hopefully this thing will, will um, stabilize and you'll have a, a nice forested riparian corridor there and they can get string credit for that. They get a certain amount of string credit for that. In this scenario up here, they're not doing any work in the stream they're actually um, just expanding the existing um, riparian corridor. So each one of these flags here is a, um, is a bare root sapling that they planted. And they're just, again, extending out that corridor and, and they can get some string credit, you know, again, generated for doing that kind of activity. This, this third picture, um, everybody I'm sure um, you, you, you've seen a stream that's incredibly incised and looked off the bank and it's basically just kind of a sheer um, drop off there, um, and and what's happening is that that water is coming around that outside bend. And it's actually um, uh, scouring the the the, the, um, the toe of the toe of the stream in the, in the stream bed, and the the uh, the bank is just sloughing off, and then and then basically um, getting washed downstream. Um, what they've done here to try to address that problem is called longitudinal peak stone protection. So they actually put stone kind of out instead of just dumping it over the bank where you see some people do which is not very helpful they actually put the stone out kind of into the um, where the toe used to be at least and and build it in a way or pile it in a way to where the stone is going to self-launch and actually protect the toe of the stream bed 
you then have the, the, the bank continues to kind of slough off and, and, and come down and, and we'll cover that over and then they can come back and, and replant it and stuff like that. And it, it's worked really well, you know, to address those really highly erodible um, areas that are where you have those, again, really high banks that are um, they're basically eroding away. And they get stream credit for that as well. So we talked about wetland mitigation already a little bit, you know, um, talked about, you know, filling in the ditches. Um, they can also uh, um, take out like drainage tiles, things like that, to try to try to again, put the hydrology back into the site. Um, one thing here you can see where they kind of scrape the area down and uh, create some low berms, you know, to try to hold that water there a little bit longer. Um, They'll come in and they'll plant this area, um, either with a seed or uh, probably put some plugs in as well to have some more substantial vegetation. And if they wanted to create a forested wetland, they'll put in trees or scrub shrub, they'll put in like a button bush or something like that and plant it. And the idea that I'm planting it is, is that you go ahead and try to get that wetland started a little faster, you gotta get it uh, um, you know, going a little bit quicker, but also you wanna make sure that we're getting good native species coverage. Um, you know beneficial, we don't want it to get covered in invasives if we just left it out there and um, didn't do any um, type of work, then we undoubtedly would get some um, species in there that we don't want, so. And you can see this banker is actually really good too at, um, so he'll work around dead snags and stuff like that, and he'll work around like beneficial trees. But if he has to take out a tree to get access or something like that, he'll, he'll actually drag it into the wetland pool to provide a little bit of substrate. And that's what he's done with that one tree that's there. So wetland mitigation success. Uh, this is one of our banks in Missouri. And you can see if you can kind of reference that little clump of trees right there, that's the same clump. And it's about two years apart, I believe, this photo. This used to be just fallow, you know, field. And now you have this really nice wetland area with a beautiful golden um, wetland buffer. Um, so it seems to be, uh, again, the banking, um, mitigation banking seems to be working really well for us. So mitigation update, just real quick. Um, we have six mitigation banks and these are privately owned commercial mitigation banks in Missouri. We have two of those, or, or we have two in lieu fees. So six mitigation banks, two in lieu fees. In Kansas, we had three mitigation banks and um, just one in lieu fee. Um, I'll say in Kansas, we have two of those mitigation banks or umbrella banks. And the idea behind that is that you have a kind of a, a comprehensive mitigation banking instrument that basically gives the guidelines of how that bank's gonna be operated. And then we're just basically putting individual mitigation sites and establishing them under the umbrella bank. And it's a way for us to streamline our process. So I, I think in Kansas in particular, you know, we're, we're gonna start seeing um, more sites come along a lot faster, which will be a good thing. And uh, hopefully somebody's have some questions. Does anybody have any questions for me? <laughs>